from the mankind. Now, you know, we, we sometimes get the idea that wrath, a wrathful God, is an Old Testament God. Uh, there's only one God, and he's the God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And wrath, which is a, a strong word for wrath, uh, wrath of God occurs 11 times in Romans. And, and, and it's always from the, the Greek word orge, which means a, a violent passion. An abhorrence. That little s uh, means that definition is taken from Strong's uh, concordance. Uh, what it speaks of is God's anger with wanton iniquity. And his anger with wanton iniquity is just as prominent in the New Testament as in the Old. Uh, the Bible is a revelation by one God of one God. He's the same all the way through. Uh, you remember how Christ says that uh, those who are rejected at the judgment seat, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God loves the world. He loves the world in providing a way of salvation in Christ to anyone who believes and follows the gospel. But his wrath is poured out on the wicked. Uh, so that's what we're looking at here. Uh, now, verse 19 and uh, verse 20 speak of something which may require us to think about this a little bit. It would be an ideal point for a class discussion, actually. Uh, because what Paul says is because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhood, so that they, that is the wicked, are without excuse. Now, that challenges us to consider how much can we actually tell from what we would call nature about the characteristics of God. I, I don't know how much you've talked about evolution and the Bible and science and the Bible uh, in your, your sessions, but uh, I don't know about you, but I, I look at the, the complexity of creation, uh, the complexity of plant life, of insect life, bird life, uh, critter life, human life, and it, it speaks to me of absolute genius. Uh, the fact that uh, the species stay apart like they do and the millions of species that there are, it, it just speaks of, of God and of order and of uh, ingenuity. And, and you know, the um, creation has a remarkable regularity to it. Uh, that's, of course, what makes the whole space program possible is the, the regularity of the uh, movement of the heavenly bodies. Uh, you can count down to a split second of uh, where things are going to be at a certain time. Uh, and it, we find that the, there's a lot of things synchronized together uh, in creation. The movement of the moon, the movement of the sun, uh, the, the movement of the earth. This is all synchronized from our point of view, so it makes life possible on the earth. And the fact that these features of creation go on uh, from generation to generation and go on the same. There's real continuity there. It, it reveals that there is, I think, uh, that there is one God, one God overall, who is eternal from generation to generation. So it's something along this line that Paul is saying, you ought to be able to figure this out uh, from just your living, your existence. How much we could figure out without having the Bible in terms of issues of morality, we'd have to talk about that and maybe, <coughs> and maybe people would have ideas. But Paul cer certainly makes the point that mankind, certainly the Roman world, uh, should, have, should not have gone the way it did. It had no excuse. And, and Paul also notes in some of his uh, messages to uh, the pagans. Uh, they, they're called by various names in, in, in Acts and the epistles, barbarians, pagans, Gentiles. 
he points out that God generously, generously provides for his creation. Now, now we, we all know about problems of uh, drought, problems of flooding, problems of, of not enough food, but in total, uh, there is enough. Properly administered, properly distributed by mankind, uh, there actually is a generous amount of, of food. Uh, and Paul makes a point that he just simply, God cannot be represented by any creative thing. He's far too great for that. And Paul makes the point, idolatry is inexcusable. There's, there's another aspect uh, to God that's uh, evident uh, just from observing what goes on around us. And that is that he, he keeps under control forces that are capable of totally destroying the world. Uh, there's a development at this point in Job, uh, where Job, and Job, God reveals to Job, it's not Job saying it, it's God saying it to Job, take a look at the, the sea. Look at the power that is there in the sea. And of course, we have tremendous examples of that with uh, the tsunamis that have occurred. In, in you know recent years, uh, the uh, the sea, if it weren't controlled, has the power to do tremendous devastation to human life. It does at times, but then it goes back under control. So uh, the point that is God makes to Job is that you take a look at the sea; it's a tremendously powerful thing, but I've got it under control. Now, what's interesting when you when you look at this section is you see some of the phrases used that are quite applicable to the Jews. Uh, and you look through there in verses 18, 19, 21, 22, you'll see phrases like, hold the truth. God hath showed it to them. They knew God, professing themselves to be wise. Now, those are little thrusts that uh, are here, where Paul is saying, look, this isn't just the Gentile world that we have in mind here. Uh, you Jews, you know, this is applicable to you as well. So he's demonstrating to the, the Gentile believers in Rome, here, here's a good way uh, to summarize the, the wickedness that has been typical of mankind, um, but do it in a way that it pricks the conscience of Jews. They'll sit there and they'll listen, they'll glad to hear it. The Gentiles uh, depicted in their wickedness, uh, but there are some. This is a way to make some use some phrases which would apply to the Jews as well. And as you go through that, this section, you'll see where there's a number of Old Testament phrases coming right out of the Old Testament. Now, the the two categories uh, of wickedness that are stressed here are sexual perversion and violence. And um, let's just uh, read through, starting at verse 24. It's not pleasant reading. And those of you who have um, different versions, it comes across even clearer. But the, the language is unmistakable. Uh, verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause gave God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. There's no mistaking what he's talking about here. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. That's where the King James Version kind of lets us down by using the word convenient, which obviously has changed its meaning a lot over the years. 
modern versions will have much stronger words there. And he continues, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable unmercy. Wow. What a list. You really that bad? Well, uh, when you look at Scripture, you find that, like we said, before the flood, that mankind is described in Genesis 5 and Genesis Six verse. Now, the, the pointed passage is from Second Timothy, which says, "In the last days," and we feel, and I'm sure, the various uh, classes have uh, hit on this theme that we feel we're in the last days now. It says, "In the last days, perilous times shall come." <clears throat> For men shall be lovers of their own selves, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That sounds just like Romans 1. So, what we're looking at here is a, a condition of gross immorality and violence that uh, is typical of mankind left to himself. Uh, and then, and then we come across two very probing verses. That's verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That is the vicarious enjoyment of wickedness. Uh, that is enjoying seeing people being violent to one another, enjoying seeing promiscuous, promiscuous, promiscuous sex. And I, I think we, we all know that in our society, violence and promiscuous sex dominate the entertainment industry. And uh, I, um, I don't know how many of you have children and grandchildren. We have quite a few. Uh, it makes you wonder, uh, what are we doing to our children? When you, when you see the video games they're playing, almost all of them uh, are very violent. Uh, I mean, it's so ingrained that um, my seven-year-old grandson yesterday was telling me how he was going to kill me at chess. And every time he made a good move, he was killing me. He ended up <clears throat> losing by a bit, but uh, at any rate, uh, I, I was amazed that he was killed. killed, killed. That, that little cartoon up in the upper right is uh, quite humorous. This program contains very strong language throughout and scenes of a sexual nature. You'll be delighted to know that. So this this nailing of vicarious enjoyment of wickedness is one that comes very close to home. And then certainly uh, when we read the account of the uh, uh, devious behavior of men with men and women with women, uh, we, um, we shudder at, at the way the, uh, this is becoming so tolerated uh, in our own society, in our own culture. Uh, however, uh, we know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. So I guess we can take a look at that and say, well, it's another sign that we are in perilous times. And then there's chapter 2, verse 1, which is another disturbing verse, uh, which says, uh, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. 
You mean to tell me we do those things that he's been talking about? Well, you read that through this and say, no, that's not me. Now, there's, there's two elements in Roman society that Paul would have in mind in that verse. Uh, one would be the Jews, who are going to be directly addressed later in chapter 2. The other would be a, a certain aesthetic element in uh, a number of what they would call religious sects that uh, existed in the Roman Empire. Uh, they were people who delighted in having very strict uh, dietary habits, very strict living habits, who would be very critical uh, of others. And Paul is saying, such people, you'd better take a look at yourselves. Now, we all, we're all aware of the, in our own society, of the public exposure of preachers and public figures who are gross sinners and politicians who serve for themselves, not their electorate. Uh, we know it's, it's a human characteristic to be critical of other people when they're doing exactly the same thing, which are, are our own faults. I'm sure you've, you've all experienced that, where you find yourself getting very irritated by somebody and then realizing they're just doing the same thing I do. So it, it is not difficult to fit us into uh, chapter 2, verse 1. We, we may not be guilty of all the sins of Romans 1, but if we look close, uh, we are guilty of some, especially when it comes to what we vicariously enjoy. And, and we need to remember Christ's definition of fornication, of malice, of murder, of malignity. Uh, you remember in the Sermon on the Mount uh, where he, he says, Whosoever looketh at a woman who lusts after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And it's pretty difficult not to watch all the entertainment that we are exposed to without thinking along those lines. And uh, earlier in Matthew 5, also in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And who ever shall say to his brother, Waka, which may, means you idiot, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell that's the head of fire. And when, you, when you read Christ's definition of the ideas of fornication, adultery, malice, uh, malignity, uh, we can look at ourselves and say, Look, I'm not Romans 1 all the time, but I am sometimes. And, and our reaction should be, uh, I need to be saved. Thank God salvation is available. All right, that's a, uh, that's a pretty good place to stop uh, for tonight. Um, all right, any questions? I, I can see you. Yes, I have a question. Ahead, Ray, you're going to have to act as presider there. Yep, yep. Mike's got a question for under, you. Under divine methods of salvation, it says every human being needs to be saved. None deserve eternal life. Doesn't God want everyone to have eternal life? Yeah. You like that. Everybody can have, but they don't. And it's evident that when he, um, right here, we're reading this section where the wrath of God is against these people. That's a good question. This is certainly what we would like, is universal salvation. But that is not what we're reading about here. Uh, and it's going to get clearer as we go along. So we might like that, but God would like it, but it just doesn't happen. Because he's given man free will, and man in his free will has chosen to do the things that the Apostle Paul Point out here. Ray, you're going to have to. Try. I can't. Yeah. That Dana's asking Mike if the question, if he was asking about the deserving part of eternal life. Well, Paul, Paul points out 
in this section here that none of us deserve it. And he, and he comes to it with very strong terms throughout the epistle as we go along. Now, as we amplify the question, I, I'm not sure I'm answering it. Is your question answered, Mike? Uh, does that mean that that means that you have to be saved before you can have eternal life? I guess. Again, I'm, I'm not getting the, the question. Mike's question was, the, then that must mean that you have to be saved before you can have eternal life. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We're saved by God's grace. We don't deserve it. And that's what these chapters are pointing out to us. We can't earn it. Now yet you hear, and you know, I'll, I'll use the statement myself, uh, boy, that's a good person. I mean, I have a few health problems, and we have neighbors that um, <clears throat> plow my drive for me. Uh, and I really appreciate it, I can say that. Uh, they're good people from their point of view. But from the standpoint of God's point of view, they need to be saved. Okay? So they, they'll fit the category here one way or another, just like any of us do. We cannot earn eternal life. Okay? Any, any? So, it's a, so it's a matter of uh, your judgment to say, Lord, I realize I've sinned. I don't want to belong to you. Please come into my heart and make me the person you want me to be. And I'll ask you to help me to grow, uh, to become the person that you want me to be. Now, is that, that's, that's accepting the Lord, isn't it? Those words. Did you, did, you, did you hear all that, Don? No, I, it's breaking up. Okay. Geneva's question was, you know, by asking Jesus to come into your heart, is, is that what you're talking about? That's part of it. What's the other part? Well, the other part, as we, we go along here, it's, it's got to be a commitment of the individual. It isn't just a matter of asking Jesus to come into our heart. It's a matter of a determined uh, commitment to him. It's a faith that God will do what he says. It's a matter of acting upon that faith. You remember the uh, famous uh, words that are in James, faith without works is dead. So it, it's a combination of things. And as uh, Paul will bring out here in Romans, uh, baptism, uh, adult immersion is part of what we need to do. But asking Jesus to come into our heart certainly is part of it, yes. But not the whole thing. So if someone, so if someone accepts, uh, says that tonight, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, come into my heart and make me the person you want me to be, and then on the way home, they're killed in a car accident. Well, in my heart, in mine, they're going to heaven. But uh, I heard somebody say one time, that's just about a skin of their teeth. <laughs> you know? <laughs> They're going to get in heaven, but they're not going to have any uh, uh, rewards, so to speak. Your reward is going to be salvation in heaven, your life in heaven, right? Again, it's not a breaking up, but let me pick up on part of this. Uh, it is what we're going to see in Romans. It's important to, to have faith. Faith is a key. Now, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior certainly is one of the things that we must believe. But you'll see Paul develop the point that we have to believe the promises that God has made. Now we've got to know what those promises are in order to, to believe in them. And then we come into association with the grace of God, the forgiveness that he offers, when we are baptized into Christ. Now, if a person, yes, they have a major conversion tonight, and on the way home they get killed, what's going to happen to them? Well, that's a whale of a lot better than not having the conversion, I'll tell you. But we don't know a case like that. We just don't know. Is that a deathbed repentance? It's okay? Well, we don't know. Okay, Ray? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I think we're, we're good. Any other questions for Don? We've got a lot of nodding of heads and... Seems to people seem to have understood what you're saying tonight, so that's good. Okay, now did you pass out class two? 
I passed out class one and two, and no, you did. Class two is what you started on for the second. Yeah, half. I got part way through it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Well, that, that gives us a jump. Yep. Uh, next week. Yep. Uh, there's a very interesting section in uh, Romans three, where Paul strings together a bunch of verses from the Old Testament, where he says, "No one." He keeps on saying this: "No one, none." Uh, are, are worthy of salvation. And it's going to be an interesting little uh, taking a look at those passages. But anyway, that's for next week. Sorry about this camera going out. I'm going to have to... Yeah, we'll figure it out. All right, well, Don, if you want to close the prayer for us, and then we'll let you go. So if you could, if you could do that for us, please. Okay, we... Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word, for the revelation that you have provided, for the instruction and enlightenment that we get from it. We thank you for the opportunity of being able to read it and discuss it freely, without fear of being molested. Thank you for this blessing. We pray that it will continue until our Lord comes. Be with the powers of this land to that end and be with those who are in areas where they can't do this. Help them strengthen their faith. Protect them. We thank you now for your blessing and seek that you would help us to understand what we've covered tonight. We ask you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, thank you very okay. much, Don. Thank you very much. Make thank sure you, you check your See email. You for, week, make sure you check your email for that brownie. Ah, excellent. All right. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.